Thanks, Lisa. Good to be with you all today as we worship together. Before I get started with the message, just a couple of things in the Bethany community I want to uh, mention. And those of you here with us for the first or second time today, we're just really glad you're here. And I hope that you begin to connect and see that what unites us here is Jesus Christ and the power of his love. We celebrate that we have a rose today here on the, uh, in the podium because what Hattie Sue Dirth was born last Saturday to Hannah and Brandon Dirth. And so we celebrate the birth of Hattie Sue and uh, God's blessing to the Dirth family. That's right. That's right. Speaking of celebrations, is all right. Do I hear? Do some triplets have a birthday today? Is that today? Is that right? Don't wanna, don't wanna, don't wanna put you on the spot. But triplets birthday. That's kind of a big deal. So happy birthday, triplets. Way to go. Um, on a sad note, uh, some of you may know, may have known uh, Phyllis. Um, Last name I always, Norvell, Norvell. Someone said, was it Norvell or Norvell? Verna said it's Norvell. Uh, Phyllis was an incredible lady, if you didn't have to know her, but she, uh, she generally attended the 8.30 service as far as worship time. She and her niece, Verna, would make the coffee each morning here. Uh, Phyllis uh, was one of those people behind the scenes that quietly just shared the love of God. Uh, one example, she would go over every week to Gwen Jasper, who I mentioned last week. Gwen is 101 years young. Phyllis would go over every week to just kind of care for Gwen, help her get some groceries, that sort of thing. Well, Phyllis um, uh, unexpectedly uh, uh, died just yesterday. She uh, had an illness that moved very quickly through her body. And so she um, got to meet Jesus face to face yesterday. Uh, it's a sadness here in the Bethany church community because we loved her so. And uh, we'll be celebrating her life Friday morning at 10 o'clock down in the sanctuary, Thursday evening from six to eight at Hodap Funeral Home just next door will be a visitation. I'm just asking you keep the family of Phyllis Norvell uh, in uh, prayer as well. But uh, again, just thank God for the uh, quiet but effective ways that she demonstrated what it meant to love Jesus Christ and the way she lived her life. So we're so thankful for that. Today we begin a new sermon series. This is gonna be six weeks. It's titled Break Free, Becoming a Disciple-Making Culture. And so I pray that this will help you and I to be um, joined together, united as far as what God's simply calling us to do. And so today's subtitle for this specific week is titled, It Starts With a Few. It Starts With a Few. And we're looking at Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 to 25. So I invite you now to hear these words. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, he of course being Jesus, he saw two brothers, Simon, who's called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their fa father and followed him. And he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and from Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. May God add his blessing to the reading and hearing of these holy words. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, as we gather today, we're remembering a time when you were first getting started in ministry and you looked over and saw a couple of friends and you invited them to come along. And so today, Lord, as we here in this community of faith, as we've had a birth that we celebrate, and a death that does make us sad, although we know Phyllis is with you in your heavenly kingdom. Lord, we ask that you invite us to come along on the journey and that we too would invite others. Jesus, we lift it all up and pray these things in your holy name. Amen. Amen. My hope today is, as far as the takeaway for today, is that you, you and I will see that Jesus modeled getting started in disciple making by inviting a few to join him 
by inviting a few to join him and, and that you and I can do the same thing. So I want to start with the question today, what is a disciple maker? What's a disciple maker? If you've been here much on Sunday mornings for the past few years, you may have heard me say from time to time <clears throat> that we're working on becoming disciple makers here at Bethany. And if you're new here and haven't heard this, well, again, we're just glad that you're here with us today. Maybe you've heard me mention Justin Gravitt, Justin who is in ministry with the Navigators, who's been working along with us and helping us on this journey. There's a picture of Justin and his wife, Kristen. And you may or may not have heard about a group of folks called the Disciple Maker Leadership Team. And they, slash we've been regularly meeting together to begin kind of living this vision of Bethany becoming a community of disciple makers and encouraging others to explore doing the same. And so <clears throat> this morning, I'd like to share some things that I hope will help bring clarity to what it is we're doing and where it is we're going. And when I say we are doing this, my intent this morning is that we, as in all of us, all of us gathered here. And so beginning today and for the next five Sundays, we're gonna be exploring what it means to be a disciple maker with the vision of becoming a community of disciple makers for Jesus. And by the time we wrap up this series, my hope is that you'll have a, a clearer understanding of this and, and not think of disciple making or becoming a community of disciple makers as something that Pastor Doug and they are doing, whoever they are, but rather that's something that we are all about and something that you and I are energized and excited about. <clears throat> so kind of as we get started here, uh, first I have a confession to make. And it's a confession on behalf of the church, not just Bethany Church, but the church at large. And so for the sake of the banner under which we currently gather, it would be a confession on behalf of the United Methodist Church. And I make this confession having, because I kind of have a stake in uh, the church at large. I grew up in, uh, well, began as the Methodist Church and a at least a few of you are old enough to remember 1968 went from being the Methodist Church to the United Methodist Church. I grew up in that church from Clarksburg, West Virginia, where my life on earth began, to Fostoria, Ohio, to Columbia, Tennessee, to Niagara Falls, New York, short stop back at Columbia, Tennessee, uh, junior high in Umacao, Puerto, Puerto Rico, and then uh, high school in Wilton, Connecticut. And so through all that, I was a part of the, of the church, the United Methodist Church. And then as, uh, as I guess God's direction would have it, I became a pastor in the church after a brief break other things. Uh, after college. And so for 28 years now, I've been a pastor in the United Methodist Church. And I, I say this because I, I think it's fair to say I've been, my life has been invested uh, in the church. And I've loved the church. And I still do. Uh, because the church was Jesus' idea. We can read it particularly in the Gospel of Luke and Acts how the church was Jesus' idea to get it started. And so it belongs to him, so we belong to him. And I believe the church is the vessel through which God can impact uh, the world for hope and bring change. But back to the confession, and that is that there is a way in which we as the church, I feel, have failed you. Uh, we failed you, and, and I've been a part of that. Uh, now, don't get me wrong. God has and will continue to use the church to impact lives in incredible ways. But there's something that's been bugging me as a pastor for 28 years now, and I think I understand more clearly what it is and uh, perhaps what God would have us do about it. You see, we as the church have been telling you and your children over and over and over again on Sunday mornings, and then on Wednesday evenings, what our mission is and that you are to be about doing it. Well, what is our mission? Well, it's clear, it's easy to grasp. I mean, even a young child can understand the basic concepts behind it. And it's found in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. You may have heard this passage before. We, we say it a lot. It's that passage that says what? Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of all age. So here Jesus gives his church the mission. He says, go and make disciples. Clear enough. 
And he says, kind of two steps, lead him to know me, lead him to know Christ, have him baptized. And then, and then from that point, journey with them to teach them to obey all of the commands I've given you and just be well aware that I'm gonna be with you on this journey the whole time. And so I think it's fair enough to say that we as the church have said this, right? We've said, go and make disciples. I mean, if you've hung around at all, you've heard this passage from Matthew 28 quite a bit. In fact, I'd rank it up there with, uh, you know, kind of the, the top 10 of passages, passages like Psalm 23 that we often read at funerals. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want or be in want. Passages like in Luke 2 at Christmas time, and there were shepherds keeping watch over their fields by night. Even passages like, now it might not ring a bell, Mark 16, but Easter time, what do we say? He has risen. He's risen. And so go and make disciples. We've told you that. So that's not the problem. The problem, I feel, is what, what we haven't done. I mean, sure, we've told you over and over and over again to go and make disciples, but I feel we haven't done much of a job of demonstrating that, of showing you how do you make disciples. I mean, it's as though Jesus' prescription for disciple making looks something like this. But we know, as far as I know, Jesus didn't make disciples this way. And so why do we? Um, I mean, can you imagine? It's kind of kind of crazy. And yet that's pretty much what we as the church have been doing when it comes to making disciples. And you know what's amazing is God is so gracious. What's amazing is there have been disciples that have emerged up out of this model. In fact, to be honest, largely my life, that, that model was a lot of what it was about. You know, I think of, uh, of this, uh, this model as kind of like teaching or making disciples using the seed throwing parable from Luke 8. And so we know if it's from the Bible, it's not a bad thing. You remember the parable, a farmer threw some seed out and we read some of the seed fell on the rocks, the birds took it away. Some of the seed fell in shallow soil, so it sprouted, but then it got burned up by the sun. Some of the seed began to grow, but the weeds and thorns and thistles began to choke it. But some of the seed fell in good soil and it actually grew and it grew well. And so we've been throwing seeds and seeds and more seeds. And you know, and to be fair, Jesus also threw seeds, spiritually speaking. I mean, you could say that Jesus was kind of throwing the seeds out when he taught the large crowds. He was casting out teaching from God's word to the masses. But, but clearly, Jesus devoted his time to other more personal interactions with people to help the seeds to grow. He kind of did what we could say. He, he tended the spiritual soil and he, uh, he guarded against spiritual weeds. And he gave those, those who were young in the faith, he gave spiritual nutrients to foster growth as his disciples. And so during the next five Sundays, we're gonna take a look at some Bible passages to explore just how Jesus made disciples and how you and I, by following his model, can do the same. In these weeks ahead, together, we're going to break free of some of what we call the myths. We're going to be myth busters for Jesus. You know, I have to admit, I put this up. Sometimes, you know, you got the, okay, okay, y'all, this is helping. Because, you know, sometimes when I attempt to, to be humorous or I'll put up a picture and you get crickets, I'm thinking, what, am I the only person who's heard of this show? 8.30 crowd, we love them dearly. Not many 8.30 folks apparently watch Mythbusters because they're like, I know, I know. All right, we got to bridge that gap. Tell them, it's an incredible show. And uh, so we're, we're kind of, I'm joining up with them and we're, we're going to be Mythbusters for Jesus. And here's some of the myths that we're going to bust. First of all, the myth that I can't make disciples because what? Because I'm not a pastor, all right? Okay, so, so if I'm kind of struggling along the way of doing, making disciples, no, Oh yeah, if you can do it, I can do it. Uh, secondly, I can't make disciples because I don't know enough about the Bible. Now, I, I've heard that one a lot. That's a myth. We're going to bust that. Or I can't make disciples because I'm an introvert or I don't have those gifts. And I get, I get that, but, but that myth is going to be busted too. I can't make disciples because I don't know where my Bible is. All right. We'll help you. We got some extras. Or I don't like working with seeds in the soil. I'm more of a grocery store Christian. I'll take one of these, you know. Or even I can't make disciples because I'm a vegan or I'm a Trekkie. Yeah, crickets. I knew it. I knew it. 
I don't know. I just had to throw those in. We're going to bust all these myths to see that every, every follower of Jesus can make disciples. And today we're looking at kind of how Jesus got started. Every one of you, if you're a Christian, if you follow Jesus, you can make disciples. And you know, if you're not a Christian and you're here today again, I'm just, man, I'm just honored, glad that you're here today. One of the encouraging things about our mission statement here at Bethany is that we're already headed in the right direction. I mean, as, as I talk about this today, it's not, like, it's not like the past has been a waste of time. God has been working through us for over 200 years here at Bethany, doing incredible stuff. And uh, you might say the disciple making is already in our DNA when we look at our, our mission statement. Much of what we've been talking about involves some of what we've been talking about now for several years. But, but I want to encourage us to look at know Christ, grow with others, and show the world in kind of a new way. Because when we speak of knowing Christ, knowing Christ through worship and prayer in other ways, that's important for me, for you, of growing with others, Sunday school classes, small groups, growing together, digging into the word, show the world through service, right? Uh, folks go down to with servants of the least of these in inner city Cincinnati. We got people going to Hamilton, lots of stuff going on. Show the world. But how about if we looked at that saying, I'm coming, I want, I, I need to know Christ so that I can invite others to know him as well. I want and need to grow with others so that then I can help others grow. And I am called to show the world because there's nothing else like it. And I want to invite as many as I can to come with me and show the world as well what Jesus is about. So this, this on the one hand is about you growing as a disciple, but why is that? So that you're equipped, so that you're prepared, so that you can bring as many as you can along for the journey. And it starts with just a few. It starts by inviting a few. And we don't believe you should ever journey alone. And truth is, we don't want you to just kind of figure it out, good luck kind of thing. I want to show you as we learn and grow together. So let's consider this morning, let's consider how did Jesus make disciples? And today, particularly, how did he get started making disciples? We read, I read in Matthew 4 that Jesus, he was walking along the uh, lake shore, the Sea of Galilee, when he saw a couple of brothers. Now, keep in mind that Jesus grew up in Galilee. And I say this today because we know, we learned that Peter and Andrew, the first fishermen, that they were from Galilee, so a region north of Jerusalem. Now, the Bible doesn't say this, and so you always got to be careful when you interject things that the Bible doesn't say. But what I'm thinking is there's a possibility with Jesus having grown up in Galilee for 30 years. He's 30 years old when he starts his ministry. And Peter and Andrew being in Galilee as fishermen, that there is a possibility that they knew each other in some way. That they may have been friends or had a, had a, <clears throat> a relationship. May, you know, the Bible doesn't say that, so maybe they didn't. But I, I don't think that's out of the realm of possibilities that these young guys that for the last 30 years have grown up in Galilee, that they may have known each other in one way. But regardless, we know this is what happened. Peter, uh, or Jesus is walking on the shoreline. He sees Peter and Andrew, and he invites them to what? To follow him. And it's interesting. They're fishermen, so what does he do? He invites them to follow him in a way uh, that they can relate. He says what? Come with me, and what? You can be fishers of men or fishers of people. You know, it's interesting how children sometimes will uh, catch you and you have to think for a second. I was talking about this verse this morning with our first and second graders during the Sunday school hour, just real briefly. Truth is, they, they're memorizing Bible verses and their teacher, who I have to know very well, said, hey, uh, share with Pastor Doug a Bible verse. And man, corn thrash, boom. See, uh, um, let's see, what was it? Colossians 3, where do all your work as though working for the Lord. And then Tiago, Tiago says, oh, I got one. And you know, Proverbs 17, 17. I don't exactly have that one memorized, but so, what is it about friends? Friends, friends, friends. A friend, a friend helps at all times, that's right. And so then the teacher says, well, geez, see if Pastor Doug has a Bible verse he can share. Don't you love it when that happens? And so I said, well, I know of one this morning um, from Matthew 4 where Jesus said, come and follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And it's funny, little Tiago says, oh, so women don't get to come along? <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, this is good, this is good. 
And so we had a conversation about how in certain cultures, in fact, I use the example of today. If I came into this room and said, hey, you guys, I mean, guys is sometimes associated with the masculine gender, but it means everybody. And so anyway, all right, Tiago, get back to your lesson. So, uh, so that was funny. But Jesus says, come follow me and I'll make you uh, fishers of men. And then it says he goes on, keeps walking. They followed him and he sees two other brothers. And it's interesting. Um, James and John, sons of Zebedee, also fishermen. But you know these guys' nickname, nickname is an actual picture of James and John. Uh, they, their nickname was Sons of Thunder, Sons of Thunder. And so you know these guys. I was trying to think of, uh, as far as how they spent their time, I think that, you know, something, what's something fun, kind of family-friendly, but testosterone-filled? That's kind of how I picture James and John, you know, like, uh, you know, toss a telephone pole back and forth uh, for the fun of it. And so these guys were, uh, you know, you don't get the nickname Sons of Thunder because you're just a, a easygoing kind of guys. And so, and so the movement began. Jesus and two sets of brothers from other mothers, right? There we go. It all begins. But there's something interesting in this little passage today from Matthew 4. In the next paragraph, it says that his fame spread, that Jesus' fame spread, and great crowds followed him. You know, make no mistake, Jesus could have focused his life on seeing how big of a crowd he could get to gather together to hear him teach. I mean, his popularity as a miracle leader uh, could have taken him to superstar status. Uh, I mean, can you imagine that? Jesus Christ, superstar, who would ever? Oh yeah, the 1970s, the 1970s. We apologize, Lord. But um, he could have been a superstar uh, but he chose not to. He chose not to. Um, but there was a place for crowds in his ministry. I mean, we know that, right? He, uh, at times he spoke to crowds. He taught the crowds. He even fed the crowds a couple of times with the fish and chips thing going on. But he, of course, knew. He knew that you don't make disciples by just speaking to a crowd, by just throwing out seeds to a crowd. In fact, it's interesting, in our own recent times, Billy Graham would throw out seeds to the crowd. And Billy actually talked with the founder of the Navigators and said, Dawson Trotman, Dawson, I need your help. Because when I leave the city, I need some people there to do what? To do like this picture shows. You don't make disciples by speaking to a crowd. You make disciples by sharing life. By sharing life. By first investing in just a few. And so Jesus got together with a few friends and the movement began. How about you? Where, where do you get together with friends? Today what? Bengals are playing Steelers, right? I mean, to that, the first person I see this morning, what do they say? Go Steelers, go Steelers. I'm like, what is up with that? But anyway, cheer for Steelers, cheer for Michigan. It's all about Jesus here. He brings us all together. We're, we're living proof. But where do you go to get together with friends? Maybe down to putters to watch the game or at home to watch the game. I know some of the guys get together here to play some basketball. I've heard sometimes, uh, now not just women, but I've heard sometimes women get together. There's a game called Bunko, right? Y'all played that, some of you have. Um, I've heard a few of our, I know some of our staff members here are mothers with young children and they'll do a mommy child play date at a park sometimes. Um, maybe you go down to Coffee Beans and Brew and have uh, uh, some coffee together. Uh, but basically, I mentioned this to get us thinking about where to get together with a friend because that's where disciple making can begin with relationships, with friendships, where you genuinely care and share with each other, where you share about your life and you hear about his or her life. You share about your work and they, sh they share about their work. You share about your frustrations and they share. You share about what your joys are. You're just getting to know each other as you share life with one another. And you share, as a follower of Jesus, how God has impacted your life as a follower of Jesus. It's funny how it'll pop up just time to time. I know, hard to believe, but it happened to me not long ago at a, at, at, at a golf course. I was... I was uh, and getting ready to go with a group in this uh, cart. And I said to the guy, hey, I got the cart I paid. Go in and pay for your part of the cart and we're all set to go. And, and he says, oh, Doug, uh, 
we don't have to do that. They'll never know that we didn't pay. And I looked at him, I'm like, no, no, man, that doesn't work for me. I'm glad I can kind of smile and laugh when I say this. I go, no, I go, what do you mean they won't know? I go, there's always somebody that knows. He's like, oh, fine. And, and so I went in and paid for him too. And when I come back out, he has money. I'm like, what, what's this? He goes, now you make me feel guilty. I'm like, well, good, good, good for you. Good for you, darn it. Yeah. I mean, come on, man. Give them what they, give them what they need here or what they earn. So, uh, so anyways, you get together and share life with a friend. That's where it began with Jesus. And that's where it begins for you and I as we begin making disciples. And so this morning, how do you and I get started? How do we get started? And there's three simple things I want to encourage you to uh, do uh, beginning today if you haven't done it before. First of all, believe that this first step is possible. And I don't say that lightly. Believe that you can make disciples for Jesus. And again, I'm not saying you haven't. You may be making lots of them. But, but today, that as we look at Jesus, model for disciple making, uh, because there is a stigma about this disciple making. I don't know if it's the phrase disciple making. Sometimes uh, some folks associate it with the old, you know, coming up to a door of a house you've never been to before and... Hello, sir. Have you been saved by the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ? You know, that's, that's not what we're talking about. That's evangelism. And you know, some people are good at evangelism and, and they are called, but we're talking about, we're not talking about that. We're talking about disciple making. And, uh, and so just believe that you can do this. Jesus began by what? By inviting a few friends to get together and to join him, walking on the beach one day. In fact, you might think, okay, I like Jesus. I like friends. I even like beaches. So, all right, I can do this. You know, and I say that rather than thinking about the whole disciple-making journey, today we're just focusing on getting started, inviting a couple of friends to share a little bit together. I can do that. And then the second thing this morning I'd ask you to do is take some moments today or in this week ahead and think about your story. Think about your story. Maybe even jot a couple things down. Everyone has a story. A story about how you got to this point in your relationship with God. It, it may be simple. For some of you, it may be a little more complicated. But it's a story worth telling because it's your story. It's worth telling and it's worth hearing. I guarantee it. And one thing I'll bet, I'll bet your story involves people not just organizations. Again, the church was Jesus' idea, so, so we're pro-church. But I'll bet your story in some way, as far as how, how you got to where you are today in your relationship with God, that it involves people. People who invited you, people who have journeyed with you. So think about your story. And then the third thing this morning, after you believe that you can do this and you think about your story, that is this week, tell your story to somebody this week. And let's give it a ballpark parameters. Let's say two minutes or less. Um, you know, just to, I mean, do what you do, but two minutes or less. Tell your story to a friend. Tell it to a sibling. If you're married, maybe tell it to your spouse. Um, you might tell it to somebody that was in your story. Maybe a Sunday school teacher. And, and as I mentioned, if the Sunday school teacher is no longer, you know, if their life has come to a close and they're in heaven, well, go ahead and tell it to them. And they're, just think of them as listening to heaven. The point is just, Tell your story. In fact, another one I thought of, it'd be cool if you want to just tell your story as your phone is recording you and, and send it to me. I'd be honored to hear your story. Because everyone has a story to tell and it's worth hearing because it's your story. You know, we have a, a graphic here that kind of, um, kind of uh, illustrates uh, we don't believe you should ever journey alone. And so we're going to be looking at this. And a couple of quick things on this. This morning, we're really just looking at the very left-hand side there. Gatherings, worshiping together like this is a, is a gathering. And, and you may know here we have classes. We have ways to serve others and then go deeper. We'll be talking about that in the weeks ahead. Today, we're talking about uh, these things. But I want, I want to make the point. What's important here is not just kind of the events, the gathering, the class, this serving. What's important is the arrows there, the green arrows, getting there, 
getting there, the movement that's happening. And maybe you can see it, the very left-hand arrow there says inviting, inviting. And just a sneak peek of what's ahead, the very right-hand side says inviting. And that's what we're looking at today. What was the movement to the gathering? Jesus invited Peter and Andrew, James and John, come follow me, I'll make you fishers of men and women. And today we're talking about inviting, inviting someone to get together for coffee and sharing life, inviting to come and to this gathering as worship. You and I can do that. Kind of wrapping it up, if I, as I think about my own story, yeah, there are people involved. And just really quickly, as a young child, I think about my mother. My mother showed me what it meant to really know and love Jesus. I think I mentioned before, when she prayed the Lord's Prayer, uh, sometimes at church, I would open my eyes because the way she talked in the Lord's Prayer, it was like Jesus was standing there. And, and uh, she, mom helped me to see what it was like to know and love Jesus. And then my great grandma, who had kind of a rough life, she showed me what it was like to have the joy of Jesus in your life. It was amazing now that I think about it as an adult, the joy that she just had continuously. And I've learned later over the years that her life was not easy. My father taught me the, what it meant to have integrity as a man following Christ. That your word is your word, your yes is yes, your no is no. Dad taught me that. Later on in life, a friend, Dale Reese. Dale Reese showed me what it was like to invite others. Why? Because he invited me. Dale was one of the first people that said, hey, Doug, come with us. We're doing this thing at the church. Love for you to join with me. I'll be with you. And then a few years later, David Garrett. David, he's out in New York City. David showed me, and to this day, shows me what it's like to be 125% sold out for Jesus. He's kind of tough to interact with at times, because in David's world, there is no compromise when it comes to your life is just sold out for Jesus. Bruce Chester, an older gentleman who was here a couple weeks ago, he's the one that showed me what's involved with patiently sharing life with somebody, teaching, walking alongside another for Jesus. And then, and then I, I do think of Justin Gravitt, again, the young man from the Navigators. Justin, among other things, has shown me that um, it's not just about Doug Sonnenberg knowing Christ, growing with others, and showing the world, but that that I can invite a few with me to join on the journey. It starts by inviting a few. So this morning as we close in prayer, I'd ask that you uh, join me in praying and believing that Jesus wants us and will help us and be with us as we start thinking about inviting a few. Who are the people in your life that Jesus might be saying, hey, why don't you invite them? And again, invite them to McDonald's to get to know them. And maybe it's someone, invite them here to come and worship. Invite them to be a part of what's happening in our youth ministry. But it starts by inviting a few. Let's pray. Jesus, today as we gather together, Lord, we, uh, we thank you that you came uh, to earth to show us God, and, and it's incredible, Lord, you as a son of God would offer your life as the perfect and sufficient sacrifice on the cross to take care of our sins, that if we receive you as Savior, our sins are forgiven, we're reconciled with God, it's amazing. But before you got to the cross, you revealed to us, you just modeled, this isn't that hard. And it starts by just caring about a few other people and inviting some friends to come along and journey together. Lord, I'm so thankful you called out to Andrew and Peter and James and John and said, hey, you wanna come with me? Because what happened in their life was they then invited some others to come, not only to get to know them, but also to be introduced to Jesus. And so I pray today, Lord, you'd help us and show us that we can do this, that you're with us as we invite others Every one of us knows somebody that may be struggling with some of the things of life. And so, Lord, we pray you'd help us to just be open to the possibilities of how you would use us. And that we don't have to have all the Bible memorized or all these things said, but we just have some basic things. I know God loves me. I'm thankful for Jesus and his church. 
and it's an important part of my life as we encourage one another. And so, Lord, I pray that in today and in these days ahead, we'll be looking for opportunities to extend those invitations just like you did. And, um, and Lord, I trust that lives will be transformed as we journey together. Thank you again for this group of folks we, we gather under the name of Bethany. We thank you, Lord, for one another and for those who will be invited to come on the journey with you. We pray these things, Jesus, in your holy name.